Yeah, I'm Melanie from GeoAR Games, and I'm here to tell you about our first app, Magical Park. Actually, it's not our first app, it's our second app, as you will learn. And um, so I'm going to share a little bit with you my um, entrepreneurial journey and the very unusual business model that we have come up with and why we were forced to look at a different business model. Experience it for the first time, just looking at it and going, whoa. Can I catch kittens? They're running around, they're getting so much exercise, I've watched them going back and forth and back and forth. They're probably covering kilometres. Although we live nearby, we haven't been to the domain for ages. And I see them enjoy it, they play it for a long time, they are excited, they want to do more. It's, it's awesome. I think it's brilliant, especially for the autistic. Cameron's nine, he's not one that will go out, socialise. Today we have seen him interacting with other children, which is brilliant, and exercise. I think it's something they should spread more Auckland wide. More local area parks would be a great idea. We have a park just around the corner and if there was something like this there, it would be so much easier for the kids to run down there and have a play around. This is Ella. Ella is my stepdaughter. Back then she was seven and addicted to mobile games. And every weekend when I had her, I was facing a fight. Because all of a sudden, going outside had become boring. And that seems to be a, a general issue with seven to eight year olds these days. All of a sudden, the park becomes boring. It's no longer excited, exciting. And it's been taken over by video games, by laptops, by other digital media and excitement. So I was getting more and more rocked up about it every weekend, the same issue. And I kept thinking, how do I get her outside without a fight? Now, I have a background in entertainment and film. So I've been 20 years in the film and television industry. And I knew that the audience was shifting. It, they weren't consuming entertainment the way you and me may do. So the younger generation in particular was definitely consuming entertainment differently. And so eventually it hit me and I thought like, if I could take the video games that she likes so much outside, she will want to go. And back then as a seven-year-old, she was really into fairies. So on average, kids sit these days eight and a half hours per day. And Ella was no exception. In fact, she was probably worse. So when I realized that I would pay for this, then probably other parents would pay for the same idea, an app that would get kids off, off the couch and outside exercising. So my idea was basically to create something that used augmented reality. Augmented reality was all of a sudden in the news, people were talking about it, but it was still low key. Now this was 2011, so way, way, way before Pokemon Go. And my idea was to create games on normal mobile smartphones that use geospatial augmented reality and get the kids running around outside in a park space. In order to do that, I had to ditch my job as a general manager in a post-production house, join a startup in order to learn everything about geospatial augmented reality. And this is where I met my business partner, Amy, who you see here on the left. Is it left for you? Or is it right? Anyway, the girl in blue. Um, so Amy one day came to me and said, I really love your idea. We can make this work. I can code this. Now, Amy had never coded or programmed an app or a game before in her life. This was her first time. In fact, she wandered into our startup, which was a different startup back then. We were using geospatial augmented reality for utility infrastructure, so quite a different subject. Um, but she said, I can make this work. 
You know, I know how to do this. And I was once one of those kids. I used to be addicted to computer games. So I really want to make this work. So in 2015, September, we started our company, GeoAI Games. So it's only, it's not even been two years, but just coming up September, two years. So we've done pretty well. So the first thing that we did was we started a pro we started working on a program or an app that was called Sharks in the Park. And we funded that by going into our first business incubator. That business incubator was called Startup Chile in Chile. And um, it was quite funny um, because they give you $20,000 to go to Chile, to Santiago, to work on your project for free for three months. And when I said to my family, I'm going to South America and I'm going to get $20,000 for free to work on my project, everybody said, you're going to get killed. They're going to take your liver. Oh my God, you know, are you crazy? <laughs> um, and I went anyway. As you see, I still have all my organs. I'm still in good shape. So, um, and I'm actually delighted to say that, you know, another team that we worked on later on is now going to start up Chile and um, they're getting even more harassed than we were, you know, that they're going to get killed, but now they're fine. So during, in, in Chile, we developed Sharks in the Park. And I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what Sharks in the Park looked like. And I'm not going to explain how it works. I'm going to get Simon Shepard from TV3 News to explain how it works. Well, one Kiwi company has come up with a way to get kids exercising while they play on their iPads. It involves a shark and a park. Simon Shepard explains. If you see kids running around randomly with a device and saying, Ah, shark! They could be playing Sharks in the Park, an augmented reality game where the player catches fish and avoids hungry sharks. And there's little rewarding sounds and scary little sounds when the shark comes and tries to get the fish off them. So they have to run away from it in order to keep their fish. And that is the whole objective of winning this particular game. Developed by software startup company GeoAR, it can be played on any smart device. You just use your screen to interact with that technology. You look around, you're in 360 degrees, you move forward, you move backwards. However you move, this technology, is, uh, the digital world is changing around you and you can see it. That's what augmented reality does. Once in a park or playing field, the game calculates the playing area using Google Maps and combines it with the video feed. It also warns if a player gets within 15 metres of a road or water. Although parents should still supervise just in case maps haven't updated the latest motorway extension. Augmented reality technology is not new, but it is seen as a way forward for entertainment. So we're taking it and we're using it to create really immersive and fun uh, environments which kids can explore, can run around in and can use to build healthy relationships with their technology. The company is part of Wellington's Lightning Lab XX, an innovation hub that supports female-led companies. It's hoping that releasing Sharks in the Park will help a Kickstarter campaign for a premium version. But at the moment, you can catch fish for free. Simon Shepherd, News Hub. So that was pretty exciting. Oh my God, that night when that was on TV3, we went number one in the New Zealand App Store. And we were like, yes, awesome and 2,000 organic downloads, and you know, the kids were playing the game for 50 minutes, and then the download curve went woof, and nothing happened. And we were like, huh, what now? As you heard Simon Shepard saying, we were in Lightning Lab XX at the time, which was the second business incubator, but in Wellington. And so our mentor, so I don't know how many of you have an idea what a business incubator is like, but when you're in a business incubator, you have like, 70 mentors of who some of them are your advisors and you are direct mentors and they all give you advice and in the end you end up with something like a mentor whiplash. So they all talk to you and they all give you their ideas and they all know what's best and in the end we have to obviously make the decision but the hard question they asked to us was asked us was how will we be found on the app store? And this is the key question where for us pivoted everything. So in this moment for us changed everything because we realized we're just going to be one of two million apps or more on the App Store. How is anyone going to find us? We don't have a marketing budget. In fact, we have hardly any money. So how will they find us? If you know anything about the gaming market and the app market and how it works, the model that at the moment is really popular obviously is free to play. Of those free to play models, only three to 5% convert into actual sales. 
Now imagine the sales being like a dollar, and that's it. Um, and then 30% of that dollar goes to the app store. Let's say you're left of 70 cents minus taxes. So in that case, you know, like we were literally sitting there and we were thinking those 2,000 downloads we were so happy about, that's like 60 bucks. That's not much. And that's not even taking the, the app store off that. So we would have been left with even less. So we realized in that moment, our model that everybody is following is just not going to work. So back to the drawing board, sit down. Now we had um, a new idea and that was Magical Park, which you saw the trailer for at the very beginning. So we realized that what we had developed was the world's first digital playground. Nobody had done what we were doing. Now you're looking at March. Now actually, yeah, you're looking March 2016 in that time. So March 2016, and we decided, right, let's go back to the drawing board and we're building a new game. It's the world's first digital playground. That's what we're selling. And um, who wants to have playgrounds? Who pays for playgrounds? Very simple, the council. And so we were looking at the council and selling them this playground. This is how it works. So Magical Park has got different game worlds. The first game world is called Augmentia, where you have to herd 15 kittens. Don't ask me why, that's just what you have to do. I guess it's like to try and train you as a kitten herder. Um, Prehistoria, where you have to run around and collect dinosaur eggs, and then Alienscape, where you have to save little poor aliens from the munching monster that otherwise will eat them. So these are the three games in Magical Park, and the, um, the goal, obviously, is to get you running around, you know, so you, the kids are running quite a bit in order to play those games. So we decided, okay, if we're making these games, we want to make them ethical as well. So we decided, okay, no in-app advertisement, no in-app purchases, no, no third-party data mining. Now these are the three ways how normally free-to-play free apps are making their money. So if we were excluding that and we were saying it's free-to-play, how on earth were we going to make money? None of that actually fitted the norm, but this is what we wanted. Me as a parent, I definitely stood for um, my, no my daughter not being constantly bombarded with advertisement. You all have heard stories of kids racking up credit card bills, right? In fact, I just heard another one where a 12-year-old racked up $10,500 credit card bill. So that's pretty scary. So we didn't want to go down that route. So by selling to councils, we thought we were onto something, but we weren't entirely sure how to go about it. And again, we had all our advertisers, advertisers, our advisors and mentors at Lightning Lab telling us, do not sell to councils. This is a really bad idea. They're really slow to make decisions. They're really slow to kind of like process anything. They take forever. It's not a good idea. So what did we do? We went to Wellington Council and we said, would you like to do a trial? So we started running a trial of Magical Park, first in Wellington and two parks, then in Hutt, then in Poirua, and then eventually in Auckland. And we had those four councils helping us and supporting us, and eventually they said, let us sit down in a room, just us, and we will come up with a plan for you. Because it was pretty clear that we weren't going to get any support from the investors, as long as we were working with councils. And so they came back and they said, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna sell Magical Park for $2,500 per park per year to us. And we will support you. And not only that, but we will give you another idea. We want you to work with impact networks. So an impact network basically is um, somebody who's looking for potential partners. A, pr a partner that has got the network that you're looking for. I mean, you probably all know that, but I wanna just emphasize that a little bit because that became the basis of our strategy. So these impact network partners were organizations that had already clients that were councils and council, and council um, park rangers and managers. So they were exactly the people that we wanted to talk to where we could set up a magical park. And then obviously the councils had their own community Every single council has got access to their own community and their own community manager or youth manager. So we realized that by following this, this, um, this strategy, we might have a chance. There is an organization which is called the World Urban Parks Forum, 
this is one of those impact networks that sits right at the top and they talk to all the organizations that are dealing with all the different parks across the world. So they introduced us to Parks and Leisure Australia, to UK Active, and to the New Zealand Recreation Association. And those three impact networks are now our partners. So what do they do for us? They basically introduce us to councils, they do all the marketing and sales, and they even do the invoicing. What that means for us is that we can focus just on developing the app and nothing else. It means we do not even have to spend money on marketing we don't have to call call councils because they are basically doing it all. Because every single one of those organizations has got trusted relationships with the councils, with the park managers, with the youth community and so on. So we don't need to do that. So it was a pretty genius idea in theory, but we hadn't actually tested it. So at that point in time, we were starting to run out of investment. We were starting to run out of money. I mean, we hadn't even managed to succeed uh, to, to raise an investment round simply because when we were pitching after Lightning Lab to angel investors around New Zealand, pretty much every single one of them said to us, who in their right mind is going to run around with a phone in front of their face outside? No one. And then Pokemon Go happened. And that was three weeks after our, later, uh, our last pitch, we had literally given up on investors and then Pokemon Go happened. So that was July. So think about the fact that we had already had, we had already two games out before Pokemon Go actually started. So we're pretty proud of that. But the key thing that Pokemon did for us was, first of all, it proved everybody, it proved to everybody that yes, people will run around with phones in front of their face. So that was number one. Number two, it didn't make it quite so alien anymore to people to do that. Kids don't have a problem of it anyway, but a lot of adults were still a little bit self-conscious. I mean, some of you guys probably will have given Pokemon Go a go as well, right? Yeah. Yep, <laughs> self-confessed, good. So our partners, um, Parks and Leisure Australia, PLA, and NZRA, New Zealand Recreation Association, said to us, Parks Week is coming up, Parks Week in March. And some of you guys may remember seeing the signs or not, or hearing us on the radio. But within three weeks, we went from 14 parks across New Zealand to 176 active magical parks across Australasia. And within three weeks, we proved everybody wrong and we showed that we could work with 47 councils in Australia without flying over there, without having one single face-to-face -face meeting with a single council in Australia and with 19 councils in New Zealand. And so all 176 parks were set up remotely. It was extremely easy, and it was all facilitated just through Amy and myself, and that was it. And so our partners managed the entire sales and marketing process, the entire invoicing process. We didn't have to worry about a thing. We literally just had to tally it all up at the end and got paid. And obviously our partners, partners got their commission as well. So it was a happy win-win for everybody. But the coolest thing for us that really managed to drill home that this concept is going to work was the stats that we got. So we had, in one week, 9,625 gaming sessions in parks. And over 24,000 people came to play Magical Park across Australasia in one week. And 1,200 hours of game time were played in parks. That is 1,200 hours of kids running around in parks across Australasia in one week. Now go back to the model that I mentioned earlier on, the App Store model. When you think about how are you being found on the App Store, what we managed to do was get 24,000 people to go specifically to the App Store and look us up, search for us, and then go to the park with purpose. It wasn't a matter of people just, you know, coming across it by chance. It was driven. It was driven by families tagging other people, um, telling it was worth a word of mouth. It was really, really powerful. And some councils said they had never, ever seen anything like it before. So the spreading the word and telling the community that there was a magical park out there 
was so phenomenal for us because we did not have to spend a single cent on marketing. Because our partners, our impact network partners, naturally had the listening of the people that we wanted to get in front of. I don't know if any of you can imagine how hard it is for kids content providers to get in front of kids and to market to them. You need to get in front of parents and it has long been something that people haven't been able to figure out. So for us to be able to get within a week in front of 24,000 people with not spending a single dollar was pretty revolutionary. So how did they do that? The council marketing efforts were obviously park signs. They did Facebook and Twitter and Facebook worked brilliantly. People tagging other people. Um, they had, some councils had like 400 shares of one post. It was just amazing. And then incentives, the one that I loved the most was a council basically said for the first 100 families coming to the park, you get free ice cream and free coffees. And that worked. And then obviously traditional media, every television wanted to see what this was about. Every local newspaper wanted to write about it. So the council didn't really have to pay much either. They just needed to kind of tell their comms people, do social media, and tell the local news and tell the local schools. And that's how word got around. So what's the value of what we're doing? For parks, or for, for councils, it is first of all getting tech-minded families outside because they've missed that demographic. That demographic is not coming anymore. So imagine a council spending, I'm using HUD Council as an example, they've just recently spent $3.4 million on a playground. But $3.4 million on a playground and then the child turns seven and all of a sudden they don't want to go to the park anymore because the interest is taken by games. So for the councils, it's been you know, absolutely frustrating. How do we get these people back? What do we do? So they had already been looking towards technology to see if they can make a difference. How can they make people come to parks after they've spent so much on recreational facilities? But then families told us that it was a really great tool for family bonding time because parents would play with kids, you know? Mom and daughter would play against dad and son or whatever, playing our games. Kids mo were motivated to wanting to read, wanting, in, in, and they needed to, to be able to read in order to play, obviously, the game. That was feedback that we got from primary schools. And then, obviously, making a boring park interesting, um, but it was also that we were able to give the councils, for instance, the opportunity to do surveys with those happy parents. And on top of that, we delivered them park data, which they'd never had before. So this is where I want to do you, uh, show you a video that is really special to me. So there was a Monday, a Monday morning. We had a really hectic weekend. And on that weekend, you know, like we had done support calls. It was during Parks Week. We were absolutely run off our feet. And Monday morning, the following video landed in my inbox, and I had no idea. It was a complete surprise. Middle school has launched its very first magical field. In order to play, all we had to do is download Magical Park. And the best thing is, it's for free! This app was designed for kids like us to get active outdoors. Here's what we have to say about this app. The Magical Park is very cool. This app is so amazing. I recommend this app for schools to play because it is fun, cool, and it's also tiring, chasing up for kiddos, and it's good fitness. I think it's a pretty cool game, but like, it's very tiring because you have to run after the kiddos. And my advice to you, if you're going to play this game, is stay away from that red fairy. I recommend this app to everyone, but like, next time they should like a, a superhero version where you catch the villains or robot themes but otherwise it's a great app yeah we would like to thank GR games for this awesome app Yay! so this school went out of their way to do this video for us and um, actually I'm just quickly gonna go back and um, so I was absolutely blown away by the effort that the kids had put into making this video. And it made me realize that there was more to us just selling parks and just selling a game. There was more going on. 
So let's just quickly take a look at the future and where we're going. So this is the World Builder. The World Builder is something um, which we're very excited about and we're looking at the moment for an investor to help us make this, bring this to the next level. But imagine that after everything that you've seen about Magical Park, little Johnny at school is now learning how to, learning how to make 3D models and how to do animations. He can upload his own models and his own animations into the World Builder and then position it in a park, in his local park, and bring mom and dad out, and here it is, 10 meters tall. And he can design his own digital worlds and his own park life-size, but he can also make his own games and share them with his friends. And that is obviously learning how to code, learning 3D modeling, learning animation, and all the things that our schools now struggling to teach their kids. So recently I did a presentation to a thousand teachers in New Zealand, and they were so excited about it. And the other thing that I got from that talk was that they said, if we cannot have this at our school because maybe we don't have the devices that are required, we will put pressure on councils to make sure that we will have a magical park in our community. So they were kind of like encouraging the cycle as well and support us. So this leads me to the big thing, which is the value of building a tribe. And that's when it clicked with me. Actually, that's not entirely true. I'm going to give that entire credit to um, the general manager of Weta. Because one day we had a meeting with Weta and we sat down and David said to me, do you actually realize what you have built? And I was like, ah, probably not. You tell me. And he said, you have come up with a way to completely bypass the App Store. The App Store is irrelevant for what you're doing because you have built a tribe. You have built a community, you own this community. This community fuels your marketing, fuels your sales. It doesn't matter how you're being found on the App Store because the people purposefully look for you. You've created something that they want and for kids content providers, this is a phenomenal disruption. This is so new and so different and the moment you have enough members and enough of a community, you will be bombarded by kids content providers who will want to have their content in your game. And so we see ourselves as a game developer, as a game technology company, not an indie game developer. So we purposefully develop and focus on technology. So you see the power of the tribe. And so if you think about it, it started with the councils that we got through our partners the different parks and recreation organizations. Each council has got, like Auckland, for instance, has got a thousand parks. Each park has got access to a minimum of 500 people, if not more. And then you have um, the community that comes with that. So you have the 500 people that come to the park that live in the surroundings of each park. And then you have the schools who want to promote and experience Magical Park, teach the kids, teach the teachers, and then fuel it back into the community. So that network, ultimately what it does, it, it helps build us, it helps us build the company. So from Magical Park, the people, the community feeds into the world builder, feeds into sharks in the park and feeds back. So it's basically becoming a whole cycle and a whole process. And the reason why it is so powerful is because we have created a community of trust that is built on ethical values. Because what I said at the very beginning, the power of standing for we are going to come up with a business model that doesn't allow in-app purchases, doesn't allow in-app advertising, data mining, any of these things, and it is free for anyone to play. If you guys have kids, you know, for instance, school holidays, how cash-strapped quickly you are, this is a great opportunity. And we noticed that we had phenomenal feedback, for instance, from South Auckland, where a lot of, females, a lot of families don't have a lot of money around holidays. So we wanted to build something that was truly for the community and as a result the community is paying us back with supporting us with helping us with fueling the cycle telling other people about it so right now we have 15 active parks in new zealand and eight in australia now these are permanent parks these are not even the pop-up parks that we have now created pop-up parks are basically parks that are only existing for a, for a week or two and we have been busy with bookings all the way through to next january that is how crazy and, and, and you know what happened after Parks Week. So we have now literally reached a point where we have our bread and butter coming in just through solid booking with parks just in Australasia. 
So what is happening now is we're just about to move into the UK, we're moving into the States and to Canada, and we're looking at a contract with a Chinese education provider. So things are actually starting to happen and now the next corner is going to turn. Now these are the magical parks in Auckland. So if you have kids and you want to have some fun on the weekends for free, then you can go to one of those parks. So we've got one in Onopoto, Okahu Bay, Barry Curtis, Coil Park is the latest one that's, that's been added, Harbour View, Domain, or Huya Reserve, which is my testing ground. And yeah, all you need to do is download the app and go and play and have fun. And um, that takes me to the end, and I think that's the, that prompt for Kristen to come up and ask some questions with me, or answer some questions with me. I'm, I'm answering, she's asking. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Great. Thank awesome. you, Keith. Wonderful. That was terrific. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate welcome. hearing about it. So we have a couple questions coming here on the Slido. I encourage you guys to get out your phones. You can like some of the questions to bring them up a little bit higher in the popularity, or you can add some of your own. I know I was just backstage thinking so many different things popping through my mind when you're talking. Oh, what about this? How, do, what, how does this work? So, But the top one we have here is, how do you plan to stay relevant in the long run? So one of the interesting things is that the more members or the bigger the community is that are, who are actually playing Magical Park, the more content providers are um, coming to talk to us. So that means that we no longer have to worry about where's the next content coming from to keep the kids um, excited about what we're doing. So we've already got a pretty great return rate. Keeps, kids keep pestering their parents to go back to the park to play some more. but. Um, Imagine you had SpongeBob in there or um, you know, some other kids' content that they love and every month it's a different set of games. So one, one way to stay current in the long run is obviously having the content. But the other thing is, is that we are having a foothold in a market that nobody has ever even thought, out, thought, about, thought about, which is the communities that are around the world fueled by the councils. So it's a completely different way of tapping into the community. And that is obviously giving us um, a really big value. It's, it's just literally, yeah, the, the, the database, the players, the users that has enormous value. Now this one's an interesting one. How have you managed to control your brand while collaborating with others? That was actually really simple. And um, it was simple because we put down um, guidelines for our ethics and we made that very clear. And we have obviously a brand, guide, brand guidelines, which we hand over, but um, you know, they normally don't really want anything else than our logo. They need to understand, and we make sure of that they understand our ethics. And our ethics are pretty much our brand. And everybody has respected that and endorsed it a hell of a lot. So yeah. So it hasn't been an issue, it sounds like. Oh, it's no. really good. Now, does it use up a lot of data or data? I can never remember the way they no, say it. No, it doesn't. So basically, it, per game, it uses 100 kilobyte um, datas, data, and that is literally only to get your GPS position. That's it. Okay. Have you always been able to follow your gut instinct? Uh, well, how do I answer that one? When you're working for an employer, then quite often your gut instinct has to kind of go by the wayside because, you know, you do what the team needs to do or what you're being told. So that is obviously a bit of a shame. But when you're doing a startup um, and you have two founders, then I think it is a lot where um, Amy and I, we both respect each other's gut instinct. and. We, we listen a lot to it. So for instance, we, we might have a conversation about a decision we need to make and you know, we sleep over it and the next day Amy might come back and say something doesn't feel right. And if it doesn't feel right, then it just basically means we're not signing or we're taking our time, we're looking at it from other ways again. So it, it has been a big driver for us to, to make decisions during those last, well, not quite two years, but almost. And that's, that makes sense. If there's just two hmm. of you, then you can actually work together for that. Now, are there other ideas and themes that people recommended to you? I suspect when you're out and about that people must have some fabulous ideas. All the time. Everybody has ideas. And I think what I, what I would probably say about that is that, and I, I, I hate it as, as, I hate actually, you know, like what people say about it, but it is, ideas are cheap. Ideas are cheap unless you can execute them. And that really sets you apart from somebody else who has got the same idea, a better idea, just another idea. 
An idea is just an idea unless you can execute them, and that really is the difference. It's funny you say that. For those of us who were at the morning session, the, um, found one of the founders from my food bank said the exact same thing, that yeah. the number of people who came up to her and said that um, they'd had that exact same idea to start my food bag style. Yeah. And, but it's just an idea. They, yeah. Nobody actually put it through like they did. Uh, here's a good one. What's the difference? You and I were talking about this earlier. Yeah, What's the difference between <laughs> AR and virtual reality? So augmented reality versus virtual reality. Yeah, so that's, there's a lot of confusion out there. And you will get a lot of different opinions depending on who you talk to. So let's look at virtual reality. Um, so I've got a film background, as I said earlier on, and you guys will have probably heard about 360 video. 360 video to me is just another video format. It is not virtual reality. Virtual reality in my definition is um, when you're wearing a headset and you're in a 100% synthetic three-dimensional environment. That to me is virtual reality. Augmented reality has been around since 1960. It is not something new. And when you think about, for instance, the Americans Cup race, um, you see the live footage of the boats coming in and you see the finish line. That is a basic form of augmented reality. It's enhanced live video footage. Um, if you think about Pokemon Go, Pokemon Go, for instance, um, has a live video feed and on top of it sits an animation. That animation is always the same. You can't walk around Pikachu. You can't walk up to Pikachu. You can't you know, interact with Pikachu. But it is a form of augmented reality. Versus in our case, you can literally walk around things. You can walk up to things. You can interact with it. So there are different types of augmented reality. But augmented reality always has a live video feed and then some form of animation over the top that is linked to it. OK, terrific. Now, how do you manage to avoid ads and going commercial? You mentioned SpongeBob before. Are you looking at SpongeBob? This is, this is really interesting. And I'm, I'm thinking the more I think about it, the more it becomes a bit of a bugbear of mine. Investors are looking for a hockey stick growth curve. And I have heard a number of times that in order to have fast, aggressive growth, you can't be black and white with your ethics. You need to be gray. You need to kind of, you know, figure out how are you going to make this work. And I'm starting to probably move more and more because of the experience that we've had towards a, why do you have to? You don't have to do anything. You know, you can just stick to your guns and you can just say, no, these are our values. These are our ethics. And there is a community out there that will support us for it and that will love us for it because we're taking a stand. And so it may be a slower growth. And yes, there is a risk that somebody else is going to come and overtake us who's got more money and less ethics. But at the same time, um, I don't think that a brand like that would, for instance, be able to repeat our secret sauce and get in with the councils and get a community the same way that we are doing it. And I think that our community will be more loyal. Yeah, no, very good point. <laughs> Where does your revenue come from? I think from you councils. talked, yeah, you talked yeah. about that a little bit before. But now, you know, just to kind of like repeat that again, so councils are paying us a subscription fee per park per year or per week. So we can literally set up a park within 15 minutes remotely anywhere in the world. And so a council say, you know, I had Zimbabwe ring me up, for instance. Um, they just give me an address. I have a look at the location. If I think that on a satellite image the location looks safe and it looks like a good one, then I will set it up as a test. And then somebody from the council or the school has to go and vet it for health and safety. And if it comes through clear and everything is good, then it's switched life and officially being a park that can be promoted. And is that the goal, to go global? Yeah, absolutely. Now, what are some recommendations that you have for AMP and how we can bring some of these kinds of innovation, not necessarily AR, but some of your innovations <laughs> into the office environment? Well, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, I think from, from the short lunch conversation that I've, that I've had with, with some of your colleagues here, it sounds like there is a lot of really great thinkers here. And so to me, it's kind of, you know, uh, have think tanks, have brainstorm sessions, look at anything that might frustrate you in the culture. There is a solution for it and some way of how the environment can be innovated. Every fr frustration basically is an opportunity for entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship. 
meaning you know you obviously come up with innovation within the company and I think um, it is important to foster innovation inside companies and create room for that for failing and for you know that failing is okay and to fail fast and fail often but also come up with even more good ideas and more opportunities because just as many will you know prove to be advantageous and make a difference to the company and I think AMP is starting that we did that last year for redesigning um, our boat and that was sort of like a think tank experience and yeah. a lot of staff got really excited about it working in groups like that so yeah we, we definitely started seeing that David would like to know do people run into each other no they don't <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why they don't is so uh, this is an interesting one a lot of people say what about headsets well see if they were wearing headsets then they would be running into each other so imagine that when you're holding a phone or a tablet you still have your peripheral vision you still can see what's coming for you you know and, and you can obviously see the real environment through the screen but there is way more safety when you're holding a device versus when you're wearing a headset. If you come face to face with a T-Rex, all of a sudden it will be feeling like virtual reality because you can't see anything else anymore other than T-Rex in front of you. My daughter actually saw, when we played the game last weekend, there, um, it was raining at one part, so I had an umbrella up and she came running up to me and she just went, ah! <laughs> sorry, sorry, sound guy. And, um, <laughs> And I said, what? What is wrong with you? And she goes, there's a dragon in your umbrella. And my daughter's 11. She's not a, a magical child. She, but she really, truly, she just couldn't get over it. It was really, it was quite funny. It was neat to see. That, which leads kind of to this next question, which I think is part of why the councils are supporting your idea. So do you find kids put down their devices and start playing on the park equipment and enjoying nature? Yes. Parents have said to us, Magical Park is like a Trojan horse you don't tell the child what this app is actually about you just say like let's play a mobile game in the park you know you like mobile games and then once they're out there they don't notice how much running they actually do so on average kids run 1.45 kilometers per game that's quite a bit and um <clears throat> and they play for about anything between 30 to 60 minutes running around but once they've played and they've had enough playing, they want to ride their scooter, they want to feed the ducks, they want to climb a tree. And that has always been the idea that once they are in the park, once I get my stepdaughter in the park, you know, we're going to be doing some other stuff afterwards. But at least she's outside. She's now open to it. There won't be straight away, you know, like, can we go home now? So we've had great feedback from kids as well. And when we test, we've tested by now with over 500 kids one of the questions that we asked them is what do you prefer prefer playing computer games inside sitting on the couch or playing computer games outside running around and every single one of them says outside they definitely enjoy it more and that was our experience too she was playing a game inside and i said well look let's go test this we'll go play this game outside and that was exactly it she's she's on the couch but mm. or she could be outside so now how do you define culture in your business it, but it's just it's just you and Amy, right? Well, it is just me and Amy, but at the same time, um, I guess the culture needs to also inspire the partners that we're working with, or even the councils, or even like the culture becomes almost part of the marketing. So um, we we have we have a couple of very very uh, strict rules in our two people company. And they are obviously, we're, we're working on when we're then having employees, when we're having a bigger development team, that we want to push this through. And one thing is, for instance, that the assumption always has to be that whatever the other person did is only in the best interest of the company. So if Amy is angry with me because I've done something, then the first thing that she needs to fall back on is whatever I did, I did that in that moment based on it was the best thing for the company and not because I'm being malicious or whatever. And, um, and so we start the conversation from there. And that also means that we do not take anything personal. So everything is brought back to, is it in the best interest of the company? Is it in the best interest of what we're doing? And personality aside. And that allows us to make sure that there is a lot of freedom, there is a lot of trust, and there is a lot of room for failure as well. I think we have time for one last question. Um, how can an organization like AMP bring staff's gut instincts into decision making? Mm, that's an interesting one. I think that needs to come from leadership. So the leadership team basically just has to, has to allow 
those people that are probably, I would say, more creative. I think, you know, when I look at Amy and myself, you've got the analytical people that like to have things black and white and based on numbers. And then you have the people like me who are kind of like constantly like, you know, jumping from one subject to the other and are very, um, very driven by gut instinct. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, I know that it drives Amy sometimes mad to deal with me. And I can see how in the past other people would have kind of, you know, gone bonkers having to deal with somebody like me who can kind of like say, I have a gut instinct that, for instance, outdoor gaming is going to become a thing, but I couldn't prove it. And so just trust that there may be something to it, even though, you know, you may not have the numbers to prove it. And, um, and I think Amy, over the two years that we've worked together on the startup now, she's starting to learn that when I say that I have a hunch about something, and, but I can't explain it, that normally there is something to it. And the explanation will come later. The data will eventually come, like now Pokemon got. Um, yeah, it's, it's just trusting that not everything needs to have numbers and al analytics. Right. And having that gut instinct, that faith that it's going to work. No, very good.